have tuned in to Saturday Science Chats and today we have a great show today. Well, I've been looking forward this, to this for quite a while. Um, we got a great critical thinker on today and uh, he's coming up real soon. I see him in our green room. Today we're going to be talking with uh, North, uh, North, <laughs> Dennis McCarthy uh, about the book or books North by Shakespeare and North of Shakespeare. It's going to be a total different uh, departure today, but it's all critical thinking. This guy is a great critical thinker. I'm a real fan of his work in general. Uh, but be but before we, uh, of course, go forward, I'd like to thank everybody for tuning in and supporting us on this channel. It's been really great. I want to thank everybody from the Dissident Science channel, which is uh, closing in on, on 4,000 subscribers and also our uh, our John Chappelle Natural Philosophy Society and all the support you guys give us because without you guys, we wouldn't be here and wouldn't have a great show like we have today with um, amazing people who are changing the world in uh, amazing ways because they're critical thinkers. And of course, we are. this is where critical thinkers meet. We are the John Chappelle uh, Natural Philosophy Society, which provides an open forum for study, debate, and presentation of serious ideas that are outside the mainstream. And that's why we are here today 
Of course, our mission is to be an organization of, above all that promotes critical thinking without malice. And this is a, today's guest is a good example of critical thinking like that. And we support and publish uh, serious scientific work outside of the mainstreams, uh, mainstream in general to provide a form of debate about modern topics and to provide a form of serious papers uh, and theories, again, without fear of censorship, and of course, to be run and controlled by all of us who are members. So uh, we, who we are, we are challenging mainstream uh, science and mainstream thinking in general, and we allow and com encourage competing ideas or models. We follow the scientific method that we, so we don't just bring anybody on here like today's guest who has a lot of supporting evidence for what he's talking about. And of course, uh, consider we also try to consider an idea without accepting it, something even the author of this book about Dennis McCarthy we're talking today uh, really practices. And um, we give voice to the voiceless. Uh, of course, uh, Den Dennis is not the voiceless for sure, but we're certainly trying to get every more and more people involved in uh, uh, seeing uh, new new points of view. And what we are not, we don't have a specific point of view. We are not a general science organization or new age or conspiracy, really to speak to fundamental science and works in science. So that's who we are. We do have websites. If you, uh, We have a, a online critical thinkers uh, website called Science Woke, which is basically just to show people that there are alternatives to things in science and that we should give them a hear, uh, let people make up their own minds. We have a uh, critical thinking community at naturalphilosophy.org, and uh, you can go and join that anytime. It's open to the to the public. And we do have a Wikipedia of information, uh, a natural philosophy Wikipedia, which has over 10,000 uh, entries in it. And we also have um, our memberships, which are uh, monthly and annual, and we do accept donations. So uh, you can go onto our website and become a monthly uh, member or annual member. And uh, it really helps out. Why? Because it costs around $2,000 or more a year to have our organization online from the server to protecting our server to the subscription of the software that we use to things like StreamYard, which we use today, which has, of course, um, uh, people who are um, joining in live on YouTube and Facebook. Today we're broadcasting live to the John Chappelle uh, YouTube channel and also the Distant Science channel and uh, a Facebook page for our, our group as well. And all these donations help. And I want to thank our patrons, Dr. Cynthia Whitney, who is our chief research scientist uh, for the CMPS. She's got her PhD in from MIT in relativity. We have Nick Percival also uh, is, has been a generous uh, patron of this, uh, of this channel and also um, uh, and organization. And uh, if you haven't checked out his web, uh, his YouTube channel, it's Nick of Time. He talks about time uh, in in ways that no one else talks about. Very brilliant guy. Uh, Duncan Shaw, also a person uh, who's of our group. And uh, anonymous donor, I can't give his name. I can say it is a he, but I do appreciate it. he knows who he is. And my father also has donated uh, at times when uh, we are looking to have help and also as Kurt Renshaw. So I want to thank those people. And of course, CNPS, the, uh, um, um, uh, the conference coming up is we're accepting papers now. Official launch was in April. I'm going to get the page up this, this month. I do uh, apologize that I'm, my dad and I are finishing up our own book and uh, I've been working hard at my real job like a lot of people do, and it will take place online in the fall of 2021. We are publishing, we have uh, Notfinity coming up. Uh, George, he's going to be publishing that on um, KDP, which is Kindle Digital uh, Publishing from Amazon. Uh, we also have another one, which is uh, Ether book from over um, uh, 400 pages. Uh, that's by uh, Ramsey. That's his pen name. And of course, we're working on our official uh, final version. Yes, there it is, our book right there. And uh, we are, uh, we've had some really great feedback from our preliminary readers. We're uh, adjusting the book for that. 
working on everything, getting an index and all that. And we hope within the, this month uh, to have the final version. Yes, we do see the light at the end of the tunnel and it isn't a train. So um, community news, people who in our community that puts up videos. Well, my dad put up a video here on circular polarized light. Um, a lot, very interesting. If you check out his video, remember to subscribe to these people. I'm going to have to put everybody's channels up here. We have a number of people on our group that have channels, uh, but I usually just put up people who have new uh, uh, videos. If you are a member and you have put up a new video uh, discussing things on your YouTube channel, let us know. We'll put it up here. And of course, oh, play coming attractions. That's why I put it in my slideshow. Here we go. Coming. Uh, 2021. Yes, uh, we do have these people coming. Next week, we'll have the... Uh, Eric Reiter talking about his threshold model, quantum mechanics, where he says it doesn't work. And if you don't think he's a real uh, scientist, get your hands. Look at this lab, man. This is so great. I love this picture of Eric's work. This guy gets down and dirty. Oh, I guess there's a roll of toilet paper down there. This is like the quintessential um, uh, critical thinker out there. Uh, we'll be really interested in his talk next week, so you want to come on by. And we have also the finite theory coming up. Uh, Phil uh, Borkert, uh, we're getting that lined up as well. And uh, been talking with uh, Steve about his uh, book, Disruptive, Rewriting the Rules of Physics. That should be coming up. Of course, if you uh, are interested and want to talk uh, on our channel, we welcome critical thinking. And uh, uh, that's what we're here for for you guys. So um, uh, that's our sort of community news for, for today. And we're going to start and I'm going to introduce our, our speaker for today uh, coming up here. And I got a few things to say before we give you some context before he comes up here. Yeah, you see, I put that up there, plagiarism. No, he's not saying he's plagiarized. He uses plagiarism software, folks. That's why I put that up there and get your curiosity peaked. But Dennis McCarthy is a really amazing critical thinker. I enjoy his work immensely. I've known him for, well, over 10 years now. Follow him, and I'm very happy. And when he started talking about this project he was working on, I went absolutely nuts because I've actually thought about this before I even knew him. I'll tell you a little bit about that. But Dennis McCarthy has published numerous works in the fields of Shakespeare studies, biography, and geophysics. His views on Thomas North as the original author of Shakespeare's plays will soon be the subject of a new book. And it is, uh, uh, well, I guess, I don't know if this is uh, the name of the book, but uh, um, I believe it's a, I, I don't know, but we're going to be talking about that book today. It just came out by Michael Blanding. I did hear an interview that they had on him. Way too short, in my opinion. That's why we're going to have a lot of time with him today. Um, and so a book just came out uh, this, this year. And in 2018, news about McCarthy's uh, discovery of an important Shakespeare-related manuscript kept by Thomas North's family library made the front page of the New York Times. Yes, this guy is no slouch. And many of the other news outlets around the world. His latest work is Thomas North's uh, 155, travel, 555 Travel Journal from Italy to Shakespeare. And he's co uh, that's co-authored with June uh, Schleuder. The book confirms that Thomas North used his travel diary and experiences of his journey as a basis for scenes in the Winter's Tale and Henry the uh, Eighth. Um, and um, if you haven't uh, seen uh, his books, uh, there's a there's one book by him uh, called North of Shakespeare, and a new book that just came out and it's hitting the circuits and making us. Uh, creating hopefully a storm in not in physics in this case because we talk more about science but today more in the literature the area of literature and histor history and uh, this is a description of the book which you can get I purchased it about a week ago I've been reading it almost through it uh, but it is fascinating if you like to binge watch 
um, anything on TV and Netflix on Prime Prime Video, um, Apple TV Plus, whatever. You're going to enjoy this. It is really well written, and the story is quite amazing. Especially those people who are interested in history and Shakespeare. So the uh, you can see here the true story of a self self taught uh, Shakespeare's sleuth's quest to prove his eye-opening theory about the source of the world's most famous plays, taking readers inside the vibrant area of the era of the Elizabethan England, as well as the contemporary scene of Shakespeare scholars and obsessives. Um, it, just to give you a background, so we don't have to talk about this, because uh, obviously he knows this, but maybe you don't. Um, uh, and I'm going to tell you why are we t uh, doing this today, because that's one people are asking in the chat is like, why are we doing this today? Why are we not talking about science? Well, it all has to do with critical thinking. But uh, one of the questions has been throughout the years is, um, if you don't know, is who wrote Shakespeare? And uh, uh, the, the reason for that, I'll get into the next slide. But uh, of course, <clears throat> it's all been attributed to William Shakespeare of Stratford-on-Avon. He was not any nobleman or any person that really had much. He was a pretty common guy, I guess an actor, uh, but also a producer of, of uh, of plays and uh people have have said well because of what he wrote about was so detailed in his his accounts of things that he had never experienced uh like the uh, royal court uh lawyers uh traveling to places he'd never been uh so this uh, there's been a lot of uh, suspicion that something is going on behind the scenes here with his works because how could he have known about all this so people like have been suggested Francis Francis, uh, Francis Bacon, Christ, uh, Christopher Marlowe, William Stanley as people who really wrote Shakespeare. And one that I actually knew, I don't think Dennis knows this, but I uh, actually read and saw um, a special on Edward de Vere over 20 years ago, uh, the Earl of Oxford. And I thought that was quite a great argument, except I always had one problem with that. And that is why would they hide this? And how did they get from him writing them to having Shakespeare being the author so there was this huge gap in fact this was so intriguing to someone that they made a movie called anonymous so that is actually about um whether or not edward de vere was the actual author of the shakespearean uh, uh works and of course today we have a wholly different uh notion i won't tell you about that because that's what dennis mccarthy is here to talk about uh, involving Dennis North, and it's not him writing him for them, but a whole different perspective. Now, if you don't believe people didn't th take this idea seriously that Shakespeare could write his works, well, Mark Twain uh, is very famous for writing a, 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 a pamphlet in 1909, I think just before he died, called Is Shakespeare Dead? And uh, basically, he he said the American humanist never could reconcile what was known about the man from Stratford with the, uh, with the writer who penned such stuff as dreams are, are, are made of. And so he wrote this thing. It, uh, it is surmised by biographers that the young Shakespeare got his vast knowledge of law and his familiar and accurate acquaintance, acquaintance with the manners and customs of uh, customs and shop talk of lawyers through being for a time the clerk of Stratford Court. Um, and he says, just as a bright lad like me, reared in a village on the banks of the Mississippi, he might become a per perfect in knowledge of the Bering Strait whale fishery and and sh and the shop talk of the veteran exercisers of that eventual bristening trade. I and I got that through simply catching catfish with a trot line Sundays. So what he was saying basically, I, I remember reading a passage where he looked at the bust of uh, Shakespeare and this doughy-eyed person. He called him doughy-eyed person and couldn't imagine how could this guy write about these subjects without knowing about them. So this this has been a long a long long time. Um, so I've been reading this book by Michael Blandon, and uh, he again this is about critical thinking. Uh, before we get uh, this sort of gives you the reason why I think it's really important for us to p depart once in a while from the um, science and, and go into something different. Um, the reason is, is because one of the things that we did, I learned this from actually Dr. Eberly Spencer, Sp Eber, Eber, Eberly Spencer from, she got her PhD in mathematics at MIT in the 1940s. Brilliant lady. Um, uh, she did a lot of work uh, in, in the area of, of critical thinking and, and physics. 
especially with Maxwell's equations. Well, uh, she would bring in somebody once in a while that was sort of off topic, that wasn't physics, wasn't cosmology, wasn't philosophy. And the reason was is because the truth is, I myself, like many of you who are critical thinkers, don't just keep our critical thinking in to the basket of science. It's not the only thing we do, that we think of other things. Once you get sort of hooked on the idea of trying to find the truth instead of trying to tell people how smart you are or uh, you have an ego to protect or you've done work on Shakespeare or, or you've done work on the Big Bang or relativity and so therefore you must defend it instead of looking for truth. Once you get on the, the path of looking for truth for truth's sake and have the ability to change your mind and um, uh, and th that's what this is about today. So it's a way to get away from the physics and cosmology today talk about some topic that's just as interesting and see critical thinking and all the same things that we apply to what we look at, in this case, to literature, in this case, Shakespeare. And the, the author here, Michael Blanding, uh, talks about, well, why did he write this book? He, he uh, said, uh, in, on, on page 10, you might want to know what this page 10, location 114. That's today's ebooks, folks, from my phone, literally. And I brought it up here. And he says in a passage, I had no idea how this chance meeting would start me down a path to trace a literary mystery that I'd follow along with McCarthy, Dennis McCarthy, our guest, for the next five years. So this is five years ago this started. And then he says something on, on my page 12, location 135, something that is really, really important. The thing that we all should say, the thing that Aristotle said, says, in more than two decades as an investigative reporter, I've learned not to dismiss any story out of hand. So that's why we're here today. It's critical thinking at its best. And it gives our outside the it, key, it exercises that part of our brain of critical thinking and saying, okay, hey, Dennis, show me your evidence and let's see what you, know, what you have to say. So that's what we're doing today. And at the end of the book, going all the way to the end, um, this will get you an idea of what Michael Blanding uh, came to after being, uh, uh, being with um, Dennis for uh, uh, five years. Uh, that's what he, that they said, at least. Um, he said, or perhaps this is the very last sentence, and it, and it gives you a clue to what Michael Blanding thought after this long journey. And uh, we're going to be talking about, uh, Dennis will be talking about that today. It says, or perhaps the passage in the play has nothing to do with Thomas North, meaning he, he's saying that, well, the claims that the passage in the uh, uh, the work of Thomas North has nothing to do with Shakespeare. So he says, or perhaps the passage in the play has nothing to do with Thomas North. And Shakespeare just independently conjured up the name Ant Antigonus, the shores of Sicily, the storm, the sailors, the lost daughter and the bear, just another set of coincidences. But that doesn't seem likely. Exit. So I think that's my, oh, and he does have a website. You guys can check it out. Sir Thomas North, he does some comparisons of the work he find. I'm not going to talk about that today because he's going to be talking about, uh, well, we're going to talk about a lot of things. So you can check out SirThomasNorth.com. And um, it, the other last thing is, is confronting the mainstream uh, before we bring him on. Uh, he is, this is another reason we're talking to him, because when you have an idea that's better than the Big Bang, perhaps, or you have an idea that's better than the quantum mechanics that people have today, or for light, or whatever it is, you're always going to be confronting the mainstream. And during, during this journey, um, here are a couple passages that I thought were very um, interesting. And if you people who have been fighting mainstream science and trying to show them all the problems there are, uh, maybe this will ring true for you and you'll understand why we're, we have a kinship with uh, uh, Dennis on what he is doing. He says, as compelling as this theory seemed to me, it's clear that McCarthy has a tougher climb to convince mainstream scholars. After our trip, I called Ruth uh, Vanita, the, at uh, the University of Montana religion professor who strongly argued for the plays and as, as an allegory for Mary's life, expecting her to be intrigued at least by McCarthy's ideas about a, a year winter's tale penned by uh, Thomas North. Instead, she dismissed them out of hand. He's just up, uh, he's just up 
uh, what is it? <laughs> He's just made up these plays out of thin air, she asked. If, if the plays don't exist and there's no evidence this guy was even a playwright, it's ridiculous. So you can see a person just dismisses it, doesn't listen to Dennis's arguments. And of course, Dennis, you know, uh, he asked Dennis about it. He says, when I tell McCarthy about her reply, he is visibly frustrated. I find it extraordinarily coincidental that she knew about this journal, but didn't write about it until I contact her about it. Boy, isn't that the truth? You find a problem with something or something new and they don't know about it and then they put up their defense. And then she doesn't even want to consider my theory. He, he is used to dismissing missiles like this, being Dennis, however, in all his years pursuing his theories about Thomas North. He's heard versions of it many times. Um, they don't want to discuss it, he sighs as he walks down the cobblestone streets. Of course, this is in the middle of a book telling a story. Again, great book. Uh, you know, buy your book, e-book. E I bought it. You can read it anytime. He says they don't want to be challenged, although he may have broken through uh, to biographers, he was finding Shakespeareans much tougher to crack, resistant to uh, any alternative theory about how Shakespeare writes his plays. So um, I believe that's it. So I'm going to bring this down now, uh, remove this. And I have Dennis here, and I'm bringing him up uh, to talk with us. Dennis McCarthy, how are you? Uh, kind of aching, David. Nice to be here. I, I got a... Uh... My second Moderna shot yesterday. Oh my goodness! And I, I cannot. No. If I didn't love you, David, I'd have canceled this. This is the only reason I'm here because I love you. Oh my God! Yeah, Dennis, That's right. I am so sorry because we'll it put me down through. for a day. But listen, yeah. first of all, I want to congratulate you on your work. It is, it is humongous. I, I've I'm, I've been the privilege to meet a lot of scientists and people's work who I know is changing the world, and this is absolutely amazing um it, it, i know that this book just came out maybe if you can give us a little story about how um, michael in, in, in encountered you and my mike he he then proposed that you guys go on a trip was that his idea was that something you were going to do tell us a little bit tell the audience about how that came about so uh Michael Blanding is the New York Times bestselling author of The Map Thief, and he was giving a lecture at Lafayette uh, the, called the Schluter Lecture, uh, which is a lecture presented by my uh, scholarly better half, June Schluter, who uh, I co-authored. This book just came out. I co-authored uh, as June Schluter. Right. Uh, uh, Thomas Storrs' 1555 Travel Journal. Uh, with her, and she's been my partner in crime for the last 10 years. Uh, she's the first uh, mainstream Shakespeare scholar to uh, accept that Thomas North wrote Shakespeare's source plays uh, because of all the evidence. Thank you. And uh, she was, uh, she presents a lecture at Lafayette College. Her, uh, uh, she's Professor Emerita there and every year. And Michael Blanding was a guest lecturer there, and I was watching it. I saw his lecture and there was a dinner party afterward. And uh, my daughter, Nicole Golovsky, the great Nicole Golovsky, who's showrunner right now for a show for Disney Plus. Yeah, there. my goodness. I was looking at her. I, it, she almost distracted me enough to just yeah. forget about you. I mean, yeah. she's quite a, quite, a, quite a person. Yeah, she's, uh, she's a producer. But we were both there and uh, we finagled so that he would have to sit next to us. And we knew he was a great investigative reporter, and we were just hoping maybe, because I, had, at that point, uh, I believe I was coming forward with my uh, George North manuscript, with the manuscript in the Thomas North uh, uh, family library that was an important source for Shakespeare plays. No one ever knew about it before. And I was hoping maybe I could get a, some kind of story on this Thomas North discovery, maybe that that uh, North family manuscript that was an important source for 11 Shakespeare plays. Uh, and, you know, talk him into, do, uh, talk him into writing about it. And uh, he turned out to be a fabulous guy, a great drinking companion. We went out to have uh, some drinks. We talked about a lot of subjects and then I brought up my story. He didn't believe a word of it at first. And then little by little, he came to believe it. And then he wrote the article that was on the front page of the New York Times and made uh, news reports around the world. 
So, so, so that writing of that article, you think that um, that ha also helped him an impetus for him to to move forward? Because once he put that out there, he was sort of putting his name on on something, right? I mean, yeah. In in and so, how did you go from? I mean, that's that's truly amazing. I I I really am amazed by him on on one side, because as you know, and everybody in our audience knows who deals with alternative ideas or yeah. criticisms of what's there that getting someone in some part of the mainstream of anything is quite an accomplishment so yeah. you must have been that must have been the best sales job you've ever done to get him interested in it or 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 was it well it was sales in the beginning but only slightly in the beginning and he knew it was sales uh he knew i was trying to uh, right. get him to do it but it uh but I believe it was just the avalanche of evidence as he said. Right. So it was just, okay, I can write an article on this for the, you know, and try right. to get it published somewhere. And, you know, we, we couldn't, but we, first it was going to be in the art section of the New York times. And he wrote <laughs> me, you know, the week before he said, they're thinking page one. And I'm like, wow, page Whoa. one of the art section. I'm like, that's great. He says, no, 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 page one, page <laughs> one. And I'm like, oh my God. So, so here, I'm going to tell you, because this is so great, a friend to know, you know, to have this, how do you say, success in some way. I know it's still a long road, but yeah. what, 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 I mean, it's like a lot of us who find something we, you know, I won't, we're not going to talk about science today, I promise you that. But, you know, someone, some discovery in science that you know is the new right direction, right. you know, you to have, once you've worked on this North idea, this Thomas North um, hypothesis theory, and then to see it on the front page, did you get this feeling of, holy cow, now I really have to get at it? Or were you just so comfortable with the idea that there was no problems? I mean, I've gotten to points of success in my life where something really goes, like I had an idea to get everybody in the year 2000 in the Samba Drome in Rio de Janeiro, and it, I, it actually was happening. And at that point, I go, holy cow, what did I do? Was there kind of that kind of feeling when you when you saw that on the front page? Uh, yeah, a little bit. It's it it. I knew it was a giant step forward uh, to getting my entire theory uh, accepted, which, by the way, is just simply that Thomas North wrote Shakespeare's source plays. We know the source plays existed. There's always been record right. scholars, conventional scholars have always known uh, editors, if you look at any Hamlet, if you look at the front of it, and they talk about the sources, they refer to an early Hamlet, an mm -hmm. Ur Hamlet as it's called. Uh, there's an early Romeo and Juliet, an early Merchant of Venice. We know this because there's records of these plays. There's references to these early versions of Shakespeare plays long uh, before Shakespeare could have written them when he was a child still living in Stratford. And um, and so my my argument is simply that Thomas North is the author of those early plays. And I've got it six ways to Sunday. And that's why all of his passages still remain in the Shakespeare canon. That's not just in the Roman plays, but in all 37 plays. And um, and they come from all of Thomas North's writings, including writings, texts he had never published, like his right. journal. Right. And like uh, Nepo's Lives, he was, they were appearing in plays before he published Nepo's Lives. So... It's quite obvious you need someone, and uh, we now have records that Thomas North was a playwright as well, writing for Lester's Men. So all of this comes together that, oh, he's obviously the author of this original Hamlet and this original Romeo and Juliet, and that's all I'm saying. But they're going to have, have a tough time because it starts giving credit that uh, conventional scholars had always accepted that there had been source plays, but they never really considered the fact that a single author wrote them all. Yeah. And that's their problem because then that becomes um, uh, that kind of shifts a little bit of credit or, or gives a, some of the genius to Thomas North, who's the originator. And it's really based on his life. If you read North right. by Shakespeare and his passages. Um, so I just want to explain uh, that theory. Yeah, I mean, it was fascinating. The book is just so well written. The guy writes well. Yeah. And, and, and I mean, I just uh -huh. got through the journey because I'm a busy guy, but I got through the journey, your first journey with him going and through Italy, right? And all yeah. the places. And it it must have been amazing. Was this was this a something you were going to do or was it suggested by Michael? Or no, was my, it Yeah, Michael decided to uh 
Michael wanted to do it because uh, uh, he got the he got the contract for the book, and he didn't want to just be sitting across from me at a table, just asking me questions. And he thought that that would be you know being an actual the places that Thomas North visited, like Mantua, which then ended up in the plays and the journal entries that then ended up in the play. We went to England. We visited Kirtling Hall, the North family estates, what had been the North family estates at the time. Was that the uh, first time you had been there? No, uh, I had been there. Uh, it, it was the first time I'd been to the places in Italy, but not oh, the first okay. time I'd been to various places in England. So it must have been, I mean, so he was literally in Italy walking with you for the first time right. through all of your work in your head right right i right. was really amazed at how he was you would he would be walking with you and you were going around almost schooling people who were there who lived there on what was going on the other thing what was amazing to me was how you your ideas of for instance, uh, what was the name of the work that is the one specifically with his travel? The tales of, um, uh, with the Italy, the Italy trip that you did. Fifteen. This one, Thomas Norris, fifteen fifty five yeah. travel journal. Right, exactly. And so you, I thought, was fascinating how you were answering all these questions. Yeah, there's a lot Shakespeare, of experience. All of these. And I mean, you, you, and, and when I read them, they made total sense. It right. must be amazing yeah. to, to see those things fall into place yeah. that scholars for probably hundreds of years have been yeah. trying to figure out. Yeah. There's, yes, for example, uh, why is Giulio Romano uh, a Renaissance artist? Why is he discussed in uh, The Winter's Tale? And they, and at the time, and for a hundred years, scholars were saying, oh, well, Giulio Romano never did statues and uh, never worked on statues. And in The Winter's Tale, Giulio Romano is recognized as an artist who created the statue that is uh, that is in the climax of the play. And they're saying, oh, well, Shakespeare got it wrong, whatever. But it's true that Giulio Romano actually worked not just on frescoes, and uh, but also on uh, statues. And we have... Thomas North, we can't just place Thomas North in Northern Italy, We can, and Shakespeare never visited these places, but we can not only place Thomas North in Northern Italy and in Mantua, we can place him in the right rooms to see the art. And he even talks when he's in Santa Maria del Grazi, he even talks about the extraordinary lifelike statues. Uh, which is what is which are the uh, wax that right the wax statues that are painted that make yes. look realistic like exactly to to uh, 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 people that were supposed to be executed that were saved people right. of nobility by, by the Virgin and, Mary that um, the, it's all uh, about uh, Mariolatry and about the Virgin Mary saving the lives of these people the miracles uh, and some people were preserved and then there was another there's another thing where uh, another scene entry in which a woman is uh, uh, pr uh, is uh, praying for to resurrect her dead boy, yes. a dead born child, right, 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 right. to the Virgin Mary, and all these all these miracle stories are in the Winter's Tale. You can see how it comes in. Not only that, all the politics of it, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. But that's just one play, and it works into right after. Uh, one of the earliest plays that North wrote. And we could do this year after year after year. I've already published in Shakespeare Survey, Cambridge's Shakespeare Survey with June Schluter, which is a which is one of the most renowned Shakespeare uh, journals and publications, uh, that in 1561, Thomas North wrote the original source play for Titus and Vespasian. And the reason that was accepted in a journal, because that's all I was talking about. That's right. I, only, I only focused on, <laughs> I, I just focused on one right. play. We focused on one play. They published it. They were very complimentary. The reviewers loved it. And um, uh, and so that's published that Thomas North wrote the source play for Titus of Aspasia. What starts to get uncomfortable for them is when I point out, and we can do this for every play in the canon. He, <sighs> he literally wrote the source plays and Shakespeare's adapting the source plays for everyone. Now, a lot of people should have lots of questions about that. Like, why do we know about this before, et cetera? And I can answer them all. And it's very yeah. simple. 
Go ahead. And there's no conspiracies. No, a, uh, a couple of th a couple of things because there's so many questions I have. I mean, first of all, let, let me, so so I want to for the for our critical thinkers who are not used to Shakespeare, right? Right. You did one of the things people do but try this to is do. A question. Sure. Right. But 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 this is a general thing, right? You right. have a new theory. You have a new model. You have a new idea. Whatever it is, and what you do is you want to get somewhere, publish somewhere. Now, uh, uh, Dr. Cynthia Whitney, who has her PhD. Who I love, in, by the way. I know that. Right. She is just, love I her. love her, love her, love her. Yeah, and Well, brilliant. she has done and the same brilliant. thing. She knows, okay, she's got her bent. I'm not going to, I promise not to talk about these things. And I won't. But she's got her bent on what she thinks about something. And she knows that the mainstream is going to like some of the things. I mean, the first thing she did when she got out of her, her uh, got her PhD from MIT was apply what she learned. It didn't work. And that's why I got her on the trail. Well, mm. she would publish, she would come to our, our conferences once in a while and says, I succeeded in pub getting published in the chemistry journal, blah, blah, blah. And how did she do that? She only talked right, about, about a thing. specific, specific right. thing, because if she were to open up all of that, it wouldn't have been published. So one of the questions, so that's what you did and essentially what exactly you did. Exactly the same thing. Okay. Now, my, my question to you is, and everybody's question would be, uh, and, and this is what you hear all the time with people who are, how do you say, who work on their own independent researchers, they go, why do you, Dennis, know this stuff? How come you, out of all these am amazing, huge super brains who are in the universities, who have studied Shakespeare all their lives, how did you find out about it and other people didn't? That's an obvious question. You said right. you have an answer. So what is, what is, tell us about that. Right. Well, there, there are a number of reasons. First of all, before me, there was no such thing as a Thomas North scholar. Uh, no one had ever studied his life before. No one had ever studied his translations. They had known that Shakespeare had used or believed they, they believed that Shakespeare used Thomas North's Plutarch's lines, one of his translations, for three uh, Roman plays, uh, Julius Caesar, Coriolanus, and uh, Antony and Cleopatra. And that's what they knew about him, and then they knew minor points about his life. But no one had really carefully studied his Dial of Princess, his Moral Philosophy of Donnie, his other texts in relation to Shakespeare plays or his Nepo's lives. And no one had even known he had written a journal, which is what we discovered. And no one had known about other stuff. So before me, and now June Schluter is a Thomas North scholar, and now Michael Blanding is a Thomas North scholar. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm gonna stop, since I can stop. This is so great to be able to talk with you and, and answer questions. Are you saying that you were the first sort of Thomas North scholar, and now there are others in- Well, Michael, I'm saying the author, Michael Blanding, and my partner, June Schluter. Right. Right. Now there's three in the world, and okay. I, and hopefully there will be more. Okay. Uh, and once okay. that occurs, there's just going to be more and more stuff found. But we already have this locked six ways to Sunday. We have marginal notes in one of his books. We don't just have his journal being used for the plays, which are unpublished. We also have marginal notes in one of his Dial of Princes. So we have a copy of his own published book, right. Dial of Princes, which he then started marking notes, right. which he used as a workbook to write two plays, Arden of Feversham, or to revise, I should say, a number of plays, so, but including Arden of Feversham, Taming of the Shrew, and um, So how words. did you, Dennis, uh, Dennis McCarthy, become Thomas North interested in all this? You, so, you. I was in biogeography, which is uh, the study of why plants and animals are where they are. I wrote Here Be Dragons, which I don't have up here, is that true? Uh, which I don't even reach. Uh, here be dragons, uh, which also studies some scientific revolutions and uh, the history of it and shows how <clears throat> the distribution of plants and animals has led uh, has led to our current views of life and earth. And uh, that's Darwin used uh, uh, the this, this study of distribution of plants and animals. Lori, I love the fact that you are here. Are you going to give me the here be dragons? Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. <clears throat> and and this is, uh, Lori, is it, can I have some more? Thank you so much. As long as I'm not Sorry. David, here, here we go. This is it in Japanese. Oh, in Japanese. Oh, my yeah. gosh. All right. That is and there, so cool. Where are we? Here are the dragons. All right, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm familiar. Um, and I wanted to show, 
and I was thinking of a, possibly a chapter in that, or possibly, uh, or in a biogeographical essay, the that the same things that work for species, uh, that how they evolve and uh, move from uh, region to region, and how they spread across the earth. The same thing happens with ideas. You can study religions in the same way with evolutionary uh, offshoots of different religions and um, uh, languages as well. They spread across the earth, and you see various uh, languages evolve in certain sections when they reach certain sections. And I want to give that to the entire history of some particular idea or work of art. And I chose Hamlet for that. I wanted to give the evolutionary biogeographical history of Hamlet. How did all of the ideas that ended up in Hamlet, how do they all end up in London? I mean, it's a, there's a Danish, uh, it's a, a Danish legend that moved down to France and the story moved then moved into England and you can trace its steps and it evolves. The story changed as it moved. And there's all sorts of other ideas. There's ideas from Marcus Aurelia and uh, Guevara and all these other classical ideas on life and death and love, etc. Plutarch is in there. There's a story of Plutarch. How did all these ideas end up in London and in the brain of one person? And as I was studying that, and I was just going to give a biogeographical history of it, as I was studying it, I realized that all the scholars, every time you're looking at the sources for Hamlet, people talk about this earlier play, this earlier Hamlet written in 1589. And the reason we know about it is because a satirist at the time, Thomas Nash, had uh, written about it and written about this English Seneca who had written this early Hamlet. And so it seemed, and he called him English Seneca because he, uh, because this, this earlier playwright wrote plays in the Senecan style. And that's part of some of the influence that you see in Hamlet. So I was going to have to explain that actually the story first came into the brain and the Senecan influence and the Senecan plot lines first were put together in the brain of someone else. And I was desperate to find out who this English Seneca was. And I used uh, databases, which no one had access to before, large literary databases in early English books online to trace down exactly what Nash was talking about, who he is referring to as Senior Seneca. Wait a minute, I want to stop you there r real quick. Now, you're saying that you had access to databases that other people didn't? No, but, but, uh, what I'm saying is that just uh, it just within oh. in 2006, So they just opened up to the public? Right, that these ac the access to these databases that were just coming out, everyone has access to early English right. books online. Sure. If, sure. they're, if they can get onto a university uh, press or there's actually even some open access to it. But um, before then, no one could have ever figured this out. So that's if you're wondering why it's, it, it took till the 2000s to figure this out, you needed these data. So, so, so the two things came together. One, you have a, a really a love of the reconstruction of history of how something got there. I know uh, my one of the reasons I'm so fascinated by this is my master's is in linguistics. I work with computers and human language. We are right. working with text all the time. My my job right now, I, I've my friend and I came up with a computer language called NLP plus plus to write programs to read texts like humans do. So we're, we're, we've, I've been working in this area. One of the things in linguistics, interesting enough, is called historical linguistics. People say, for instance, we don't have any living or never have any written knowledge of Indo-European language. There's none. What that is coming from is that linguists look at all the languages, where they are, That's all it. the sounds, and you do what we call reconstructive. Yes, exactly right. yes. and so you that's something that you enjoy. This is something yeah. like your brain just yeah. just does. So you put that idea of trying to re here's something that I'm gonna pick. And uh, one, I did science, now I'm gonna pick something in the arts, literature, you pick Hamlet, and then you say, okay, um, how did this come to, to to pass? How did this get in one person's head? Well, I'm going to go back and, and reconstruct it. And then when you did that, um, you're also saying that in order to have done what you do, have done, it couldn't have happened until the advent of having all of this text digitized and being able to do. So maybe we can talk about um, that part of it. So you have had you were doing it, you didn't really know what to expect, then all of a sudden you have this access to this immense amount of uh, uh, data, and now you can say, without having, having that and the tools, the plagiarism tools, for instance, that you were using, you would have, we wouldn't be talking today, there would be no book, is that right? 
Yeah, probably not the, so for, there are two things. There's the databases and the database search, which is hugely, which led me to discover that Thomas Nash is referring to um, Thomas North as the original author of this early Hamlet, which no one denies exists. Right. Someone had to write it. <laughs> All I'm doing is giving you a name. Right, right. And that's, and he does it by quoting his work and he refers, he puns on his name, Boreas. He refers to at one point, he refers to Plutarch's lives. He refers to the ape and the glowworm story. He's constantly right. referring to this translator who other people are following. And he quotes his work. And when you put the line in, only one uh, one word comes up or one work in the right. work that's following him. And it's very obvious what he's saying once you have these databases and you have these, we couldn't understand these references. Even the top scholars of today couldn't understand all of the literary references that Nash was making because their mind isn't soaking in this, you know, in this Elizabethan uh, milieu. But uh, so in any case, you find out that it's Thomas North. And then what I did next was eventually within a few years, uh, I put all the works of Thomas North and all the works of Shakespeare into plagiarism software. And it's just, passage after passage after passage after passage there's a number of reasons and there's a lot of smoking guns uh but if you go to sirthomasnorth.com and just scroll downward right, and to right. see all of the passages it's literally hundreds and that's and i only have half of them up and you just have to get to the bottom and just seeing that's all thomas north on the left and shakespeare right. on the right and it just becomes um my it, question it's to you, yeah. It's every play and it's everything North ever wrote. <laughs> Other than that, you don't have much evidence, right? Right. And that's and we got and that's and then his life. And it all comes together yeah. at certain times in well, certain years. So it's it's a it's an extraordinary confluence of evidence. So that you have what Thomas North is doing at the time, that ends up in the play. What he's writing at the time, that ends up in the play. And we could do this year in, year out for 50 years. And all I'm saying is that the author of the plays we right. know existed, the author of the earlier Romeo and Juliet, the author of the earlier Merchant of Venice was Thomas North, and they don't even have a candidate for it. Right, They're I know, I know. To God it's not the same guy, and it is the same guy. I mean, the evidence so strong. Uh, uh, so I got another question for you. So Michael, who wrote the book that just came out, um, he obviously, you said, when you sat in, at that table and were doing your basically pitching him the project, pitching him to do something, uh, to write something about this. You said I eventually- we really doing it. I was just telling him, oh, I got this. I know, I know, I know, I know. A little more subtly than that. That's but right. he, yes, he, yes, he knew. Yeah, I yeah. understand. Cause I, you know, I made a documentary film. I had to go around, you know, subtle, you know, stuff yeah. as, as well. And the name of my, my documentary wasn't gonna win anybody's hearts. So um, <laughs> what, what, yeah, right. Yeah, I want, again, I'm gonna talk about that. But um, when he, was it the, the question is the play the thing that you see on your home page that is just so striking um was that before you met um uh yeah. michael Blanding. michael Blanding, yeah okay so you had that in hand so that was some of the stuff right. that you were able to show him right yeah yeah uh i didn't have the website uh, the website right. I, when he's <laughs> <laughs> was going to publish it. I started working on a website uh, right. to get it so that people, because yeah. the truth is he doesn't really go too much into all the borrowed passages. Sure, sure. He, because you couldn't. It's another three hundred pages. No, it's and, it's, go, uh, it's going to be PhDs and theses for the next couple hundred years, in my and, opinion. That's what that's what it is. And he's uh, so I put a website if you want to see it. It's like an appendix. And that and that really is the lockdown proof in which you can show that there, you know, it can't be a coincidence. And some of them, and you have to realize that some of the passages, it's clearly verbatim where where North right. has his. Whoops, I think we lost him here. Um, I'm going to keep talking. Um, if you can hear us, um, uh, if you can hear us or me, Dennis. Um, you have frozen up here. His. Oh, okay. I think, whoop, whoop. Yeah, we got a connection problem. Okay, you're good. You are back. All right. 
So yeah, we if you uh, just tuned in, we're talking with uh, Dennis McCarthy. Um, uh, he had frozen, but he is back. And you, there you are, and you are back. There you go. We had lost. We had lost. We had lost you. We have a little bit of connection problem on your side a little bit, but that's you know these things happen. So. Sorry. So, okay, so we were talking about, um, you know, you had all these passages. Uh, right. I, got this, I set up uh, this website for all of the uh, all of the passage connections because you right. can fit it into a book. So this is mostly his life. And I encourage people, and make sure you read that last chapter. It's not just that last. Oh, no, chapter. I didn't. Yeah. My no, last absolutely. eight pages is just devastating. And he's oh, just talking is, yeah. about one last example. And that's actually from uh, that. It's a passage that was marked in Thomas Norris's own Dial of Princess. And it's clearly the origin of the uh, most famous stage direction in the Shakespeare canon, Exit Pursued by a Bear. bear in, yeah, I read that whole thing. That is in, uh, just, it's, in fact, it's in his last sentence. And, it's in I'm his sorry? last sentence of the book. It's in the last yeah. sentence of the book, yeah. right? Yeah. And he says exit. I mean, <laughs> right. End of book. Yeah, it's a killer. It's a killer last chapter. It's really yeah, no, yeah, it is. Now, a question. Here's here's a question. When did you have what we call we have this aha moment? That is, you know, when you are looking around, you're doing your work and it all of a sudden just hits you like a ton of bricks. I've had about three or four of those scientifically, not because of my work necessarily, actually because of other people's work where I looked at something and went, oh, my gosh. When did you when did this hit you? Was it something that a couple there, of things hit you? Well, there, there have been three or four major moments. Um, uh, finding, you know, finding out that Sir Thomas North was the author of the early Hamlet was not that um, mind blowing simply because, you know, well, how many other plays did he write? Okay. So, you know, you know, and I wasn't even sure, is this really true? And then I would find that in other satires, that Nash and Harvey and Johnson, other satirists of the era, Ben Johnson, Gabriel Harvey, uh, were also referring to Thomas North and his relationship to Shakespeare. And there's all sorts of references to Shakespeare of having adapted earlier plays. There's not so there's not just earlier plays. And you go on my website, uh, uh, the, one of the pages. Did Shakespeare really adapt old plays? Yes, and no one denies this. But there's all sorts of allusions. There's a famous allusion to Shakespeare as an upstart crow. Uh, beautified by our feathers, which refers to uh, crow as a Horatian symbol for plagiarism, and it means that this uh, this guy Shakespeare was uh, using our plays, our works, and he was getting all the all the credit for them. There's another uh, famous line by Ben Jonson: "He would buy the reversion of old plays." That's like the copyright at the mm -hmm. time. He would buy the reversion of old plays, and marks not whose twas first and after times may think it to be his. In other words, the future may think it's his because he's not marking the original authors of the uh, plays he's adapting. Even so decades afterwards, is the guy do, rewriting, reworking Titus Andronicus. He's putting his own version. He says, by the way, I heard from someone intimately uh, acquainted with the stage that this was not originally Shakespeare's. Someone else wrote it. So you see this again and again and again throughout that right. people were saying that Shakespeare uh, that Shakespeare adapted old plays, and this became more and more powerful evidence. So Thomas North. So I started finding out more and more references to Thomas North as the original author, but I started also trying to research his life, and it occurred to me that the Tempest, which is the final swan song of the play, is a is very much like Thomas North's biography. Because he ends up broke at the end, he ends up not able to, uh, not supported by his brother. In fact, kicked off the family estates, and um, and that's exactly what happens in the Tempest. Uh, and he has a daughter, and it's the same story as as you like it. And so I started looking. Well, did anyone else? Has anyone else considered the Tempest or as you like it as part of a story of Thomas North's life? Has anyone figured this out? And uh, I checked for the name of the daughter in uh, As You Like It is Rosalind. And so I looked up, and Thomas North's daughter is Elizabeth North. I said, has anyone ever 
put Rosalind and Elizabeth North together. And uh, I look up and I, there's a Spencer Scholar from 1905 and Spencer Scholars accept this, that the original for Rosalind in uh, Spencer, Edmund Spencer Shepherd's calendar was Eliza North. And that there's oh also God. the clues showing it. And this isn't me. These are Spencer Scholars sure. saying, hey, we think that's Elizabeth North. And that's and that's the sure. Rosalind of As You Like It. And, it, and so that was like, OK, and like I'm up and I'm like, that's it. That's it. Because I'm coming at this from a completely different right. direction. There's, you know, there's millions of women, young women in England at the time. And I'm coming at it from looking at As You Like It and looking at the life of Thomas North and saying, you know what? I think Rosalind is Eliza North, Thomas's daughter looking at it from this direction. And then there, Spencer scholars are looking at it from what Spencer wrote about Rosalind and Shepard's calendar and say, I, which is the source for the Rosalind. You know, I, we think Rosalind is Elizabeth North. And so both of us from two different directions match on the same person. I went, that's it. It's gin, as I like to say, that's over. And then I started getting another one is the plagiarism software when all the passages just, lit up i was like okay okay this is so that was a big moment when did that happen the eliza north thing yeah that mm -hmm. happened uh, probably 2008 maybe it definitely happened i wrote about it in my first work north of shakespeare which i took off right. they can't get it by the way they can only get north by shakespeare right writing's right. Right. um but that was i wrote north of shakespeare just because i was worried about priority i was I was terrified that other people were going to come up and say, oh, by the way, I was waiting any day for, you know, waking up, say, oh, by the way, Tom North wrote the, you know, wrote Shakespeare's plays, and then I, I don't have priorities. So I published that, right. it self-published. Right. And, uh, and then when I wanted to get published in, um, in credible uh, journals, English journals, Shakespeare journals, I removed it. And June Schluter also asked me, we should get rid of that or else we're never going to get published. So I took it down and uh, and uh, and now sh now, uh, now, you I, 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 now you can talk about it. Now you can talk about it. Now I can talk about it. But yeah, that, <laughs> there's a chapter on it in uh, in that book. So it was before 2011 is the answer. So so that was a big aha moment for you. More that was a big aha moment. The plagiarism software is a big aha, aha moment. The George Earth manuscript, the, I, the journal, and the things. Norse Journal and its use in Henry VIII. So we we had this Six Ways to Sunday, and this is just in 2015 we discovered, right. and we have the George North Journal, and now we discover. And June. Tell us, tell us, I know you're going fast here. Sorry. Tell us about no. It's okay. It's okay. Um, so so let's talk about the North Journal. Now I, I have a lot of questions. I mean, is this something that happened because of your curiosity? You going searching out? Did no. somebody else find it? Tell June, the story June because Schluter's, my partner, June Schluter, who's a, one of the greatest people alive, uh, and she's uh, as good a person as she's uh, as she is a scholar. Her husband found notice to a work. I believe it, it was at Huntingdon library that uh a manuscript that's called sir thomas north his life his travels uh and it was his journal and neither was uh, june Schlitter really couldn't believe it and i was like shocked and i you know and i tracked it down i tried to find um and it, the the night that she sent me the email it was an exhausting night i worked 16 hours on this i've been working Tw over 12 hours a day on this for years and years and years there's no days off and i it was a very exhausting day and she sent me this like in the evening or 9 at 10 p.m and i traced down the journal and then i i i started searching and i was up till two three four in the morning because i found there were excerpts of it online someone had pu published it in the 1770s had found one of the copies of the journal and published it in the first published translation first published of thomas North's journal was in 1770s it had uh the beginning a little bit of the beginning of the trip and uh so i just found that i just consumed i just read it and then within a few months they actually at sotheby's at sotheby's they sold the original they were selling the original 
I might get this wrong or it was just the year before. But they sold the uh, original of it, but they didn't know when they were selling the original. They didn't know that it was Thomas Norris. So Why know. didn't you buy it? <laughs> I, buy, I, was, I was thinking of doing it. They ended up buying it. They said $5,000. Oh, my gosh. Uh, they were thinking that it was going to go for it. That was the, the, oh the my price. No, no, no. What happened, it had just been sold six months before. And I was going to try to go to them, whoever bought it, which was Lambeth Palace, right. and buy it from them. I think that's I think that's the story. I remember trying to buy it, but um, I they bought they ended up buying it for fifty thousand oh. dollars. And there's a, uh, a lovely guy there named Giles. Uh, he said, "Well, we didn't never sell it to you, but um, oh. but but they didn't but they didn't know how important it was." Can you um, imagine how much that's going to be worth? I know. I mean, that's that's going to be uh, it may be rarer than shakespeare shakespeare it is it's, it's used for what it goes yeah. so did that whole thing then get digitized the entire thing or was it already or not no it, you... was, it was it was so since google books did that phenomenal right digitization of all all known works so there's some parts of it that were were digitized and um how did you get a copy of it then? I mean, how did you I, uh, work on it? How did you work on I it? I asked, uh, I went to, uh, I had a, what, what I typically do and what I do with the George North manuscript, what I did with Roger North's household accounts, et cetera. What I typically do is I, I pay someone to take pictures of every page. Okay. And um, I'm pretty sure that's what I did. And they so how many me, page, how many pages were? Uh, hundreds, um, hundreds, <laughs> oh, gee. right? And they look, wow, is yeah. that and, and the person was going through an actual book, the actual book, the actual thing, taking a picture, and it's and I get wow. a PDF of it. And I, you know, I do that with uh, other works as well. They said, you know, they send me uh, Whoa. all the documents, but it costs it costs money to do, yeah, of course. You know how much money I've made on this discovery so far? <laughs> does it start with a negative sign? Yes, it does. <laughs> <laughs> that's so sad it's so sad but i I'm, i'll tell you you know what you know what's what's amazing to me is i mean the evidence is overwhelming it's it's like other things that i think in science that are outside mainstream that are overwhelming again not, i promise not to talk about those things but once you see it once you see it i mean you can't unsee it you can't unsee yeah. it you, yeah. you just can't now tell me a little bit about another fascinating part for me especially is the plagiarism software so so you, you basically what you're saying is a lot of things that even like my father and i working on a book about a model for the universe etc yeah there's a lot of things we could have never gotten to because we had to do he had to do calculations that a, a home computer can do today that you couldn't do before tell me a little bit about how did you come across first you got the text and what what was the idea about plagiarism in the software explain that to the person who doesn't know what that is so it's what teachers often use to try to catch uh, cheating students but the the software that I use um, just goes through and you can search for three word strings four word strings five word strings six word strings etc and just if they have identical all the identical matching strings of words will come up now, anytime you do this with any two large works, you're going to find lots of, uh, you know, lots of little innocuous phrases or even lines. You might get up to five word or five word string if it's really uh, general, like, hey, how you doing or something like that. But um, uh, there were just so many that did come up. And then when you check the context, you realize that the author of the plays is when he's writing the passage is recalling the passage because it's on the same subject. So, for example, uh, in Henry VIII, which is what I just did. So not only is the journal used in uh, in Henry VIII, but what Thomas Earth is writing at the time is Dial of Princes, and you find passages from Dial of Princes. One of them is a uh, word that might be to the prejudice of, which pops up on plagiarism software, both of them. And uh, both in both passages, both in Henry VIII and North Dial of Princes, it's talking about the hateful heart and spleen of an elder gossip. Mm -hmm. And the elder gossip, an elder gossip then defends himself saying, I have never spoke word that might be to the prejudice of any, or in Henry VIII, truly sir, I never spoke word that might be to the prejudice of, uh, oh, I got the thing, sorry. Oh, uh, okay. This is, 
I'm hi. This is my daughter, and I'm. On oh, a, hello. A, Say hello. Hi. Congratulations on your I'm work on a, as well. I'm on a thing, so I can't talk. I don't. <laughs> okay. I don't right, bye. <laughs> Yeah, she's quite. Congratulations on an amazing right. daughter. I yes, mean, she nice. is she, she is quite amazing. So, right. so what? You, tell me. Maybe I'm going to pull this out a little, a bit more. What you? So you find, but the the point right. is, you find the lines which are okay. rare okay, gotcha. or in some cases unique, and that's right. you know, unique in the history of the English language. No one else has ever said word that might be the prejudice of. But not just that. It's not like oh, they coincidentally right. said it at different times. They're saying it at in the exact same kind of passage. Right. So here, it's not that Thomas North has the Dial of Princes open in front of him. He's just writing about a similar circumstance uh, about hateful the hateful spleen of an elder gossip, and it's Wolsey in the play. And he recalls the passage he wrote, so he he writes an identical line that he wrote earlier. So you find different language. You know, another one is you know Iago's speech on the thief of reputation you know but he that filters from me my good name robs me of right. you know that which not enriches him that so that line but he that uh filters from me my good name robs me of that right. line is essentially in another passage which is saying the exact same thing again the person is not the, uh, the playwright is clearly recalling right. the passage right. in north road right. and it's borrowing a line wholesale so you find all this language so you not only so we not only have passages hundreds of them plagiarized from Thomas North. We have hundreds of them that are recalled from right. Thomas North. Right. And it can't be denied that they're recalled, that, that the playwright is doing it because he's using language that no one else used right. in the history of the world. Right. And he's using it to make the exact same complicated idea. <laughs> now, now, that's, I mean, uh, a couple of questions. Obviously, you have with plagiarism, they have their automatic tools. How much did you have to do on top of that? Because when I when when you do that, there's synonyms, there's uh, um, things that sort of word a little bit differently. You know, the plagiarism tool doesn't go and understand these things at a story level. I know because I I, I write yeah. computer programs to do this. So how much did you really have to? Um, uh, do yourself once you got clues right. then you didn't you just put them next to each other and then start doing this by hand well, when, when you get the you can in the plagiarism software i use which is w copy find uh uh but i can't won't think of the name i will i will i often give credit to that particular software w copy find which was uh, invented i can't think of the name of the inventor but in any case uh it allows you the opportunity to first just find the lines, the matching lines, the matching phrases, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then you're able to, then there's another one where it shows you in the context, it shows you all the work. Oh. So, so you, and you can just click on it, it flashes up in red, it highlights, it highlights it and it's, and it links to the other passage. So you, you go, you see the passage and the one, you click on it and it shows you, you've got two screens, you've got Thomas Norris works, Shakespeare works, and it will take you right to that passage. Wow. So it's really, I mean, this is really bizarre if you really right. think about it, right? Here are these guys in what, the 14th, 15th, 16th centuries, these people are writing, right? And now we have computers that go back and show basically what people, uh, Shakespeare was doing how you know where he got it from, how and where he put it, uh, those kinds of things. So it, it's almost like archaeology in some sense, right? It's just that yeah. the arch uh, what you're using are the streams of letters and words on a page or DNA yeah. fingerprinting, or, right? Yeah, exactly. Graphic linguistics is this did is you, this is did, very much like how they cut the uh, uh, Unabomber which is forensic right. linguistics in which they were able to, he wrote this manifesto for this newspaper and they were able to tie it right to the letters and personal right. writings of, uh, and it's through right. similar lines and similar language. And they're like, okay. And saying the exact anti-technology arguments. So you right. see the same line in anti-technology arguments. They know, okay, this is our guy. And they search his cabin and got him. Um, right. Right. Of Kaczynski, but I'm sorry. Yeah, it's very, it's, this is very science-based and it's very um what are the what are the problem 
Right. Now, one of the things is, is obviously the last sentence of the book with Michael, he makes it very clear. And by the way, detail, 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 just happened by coincidence, right? And right. obviously- and that's just the one it. thing. He has exactly. eight pages of it. Okay. But what is, what is the, did you do any mathematical calculations as to the probability or was just- Yeah, it was, I did it for when I was doing the George North manuscript, but, but it's much, with the George North manuscript, see- uh, the one manuscript that North used, this one made the front page of the New York Times, right. was written by his cousin. It was dedicated to his brother. It was kept at his family library. And it complements Thomas North's writing, both for translation, both for invention and translation. Um, and, um, uh, and Thomas North clearly read it, and he echoes it. But those echoes are much more subtle than when he's remembering what he wrote himself and which will write a whole line. But even still, I showed that the odds of these words coming up in the same passage, and you can do it just, uh, you know, um, you can do it just on probability analyses that you right. probably learn. And, uh, I mean, like you said, basically, basically of almost all text that's available uh, digitally, which right. is a huge amount of the human race's texts. It's, it's not on Google. You Some of the, yeah. in terms of the Thomas North, the Thomas North hits. And yeah. There's no other works on Google, <laughs> which supposedly has 140 right. billion uh, right. web right. pages. But that's you know, there's only seven billion people. Uh, it, but what that is, that's right. all the books. He's talking about all the um, uh, every single copy of a page. You know, uh, but still, that's it's it's literally trillions of web pages. And all and there's 40 million books on Google Books that are right. searchable. So I mean, right. you know, right. and I have early English books online. It appears nowhere. It appears nowhere in the traceable history of the English language. So it's not one in a million or one in a billion or one in a trillion. It's once in the history of the English language. And right. this is coming up again and again and again. If you go to SirThomasNorth.com, many of those lines that are being right. borrowed, many of those things, there's just you cannot dispute it. Right. Right. And what you right. get to the bottom, you go, OK, this is over just there. And now you got Norse life. Now we know why he wrote the place, when he right. wrote the place. He's writing for Lester's men and then William Shakespeare putting on 40 plays a year. Right. And he, gets to, he puts out the plays that um, uh, he and he adapts to plays a uh, hold on. I got to shut the door. No, no problem. Uh, he adapts two plays a year. He just he's adapting. Uh, Thomas Norris plays. By the way, William Shakespeare also adapted plays of other people. And right. those also appeared with his name on them, like uh, Locrine and Yorkshire Tragedy and London Prodigal. While he was alive, these plays were printed with his name on them. The right. reason they've been removed from the canon is because they seem unShakespearean. So, and scholars have to argue, oh, well, have to argue what is in essence right. a conspiracy theory saying, oh, no, 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 he didn't, Shakespeare didn't write those plays. Uh, corrupt printers were foisting uh, uh, them on Shakespeare, which is a conspiracy theory that all yeah. these corrupt printers were trying to, you know, and trying to make good on Shakespeare's name. But uh, the fact is Shakespeare actually adapted all those works. Those right. other works just weren't originally written by Thomas North. So they don't seem Shakespearean. Here's, here's an overall question for you. Is it now that you've gone through this journey, right? There's all of these, ideas. I'll give you a stupid idea that I had when before I even knew you before I was in any of these critical thinking arenas. I thought how it must have been awful for whoever really wrote these Shakespearean plays to never have been recognized for them. And I felt some sort of whatever. And now we have an idea for when I started when I started this book, I've read again, I've read only part of it, the very couple first chapters, the last chapter. But it seems like you get a different picture a little bit of who Shakespeare was. He seemed a little bit more conniving, more kind of, um, uh, I, I don't, it, it, do you see that it did, is he the literary, literary genius or was it the case he truly was, but he also had this thing where is he, was he using Thomas North? Like I've got these great things. I just know how to put them together. Was it luck? Was it, Tell me about what you think Shakespeare is now that you know 
this Thomas North connection that he took him. And you said, from what I understand, he didn't put, he, he sort of didn't put his name there. Sort of like Einstein didn't put down that his wife well, probably helped him. I well, mean, what, what, what about that well, person? So the people knew that Thomas North wrote the plays. The, the fact that uh, there's a, first of all, there's a, uh, there's a lost play database and there's just recent a book on lost plays of Shakespeare, England by David McInnes. Um, which just shows that there's thousands of lost plays from the era because no one was printing plays at the time. And uh, before I go into that question about Shakespeare, which I will, I want to sure. explain that it's uh, as insiders, as insiders in comedy and uh, the theater history know, and this is true, this isn't something wild. Abbott and Costello didn't originate who's on first. What they did was uh, they adapted an old vaudeville routine. Right. And that old vaudeville routine was who's the boss on what what street and you know right. uh, you know what is the name of the boss no what is the name of the street and it's a, you know and it's the same thing it's just you know who's the boss now that was an original every single question you have for why uh, Abbott and Costello got credit for it and why why don't we know about who's the original author every single question you have has an analogous question regarding Thomas North or everything you question you have about Thomas North has an analogous question and the answers are identical in each case. So you say, well, why didn't these original people who wrote the Who's the Boss Kid want credit for the work? They did get credit for the work when they originally put it out there. Right. They got money. They got same thing with Thomas North. He got paid. He got right. applause. He was known right. for the record. So, well, why don't we have record of record of what? The applause? We do have. Well, why isn't there any record of the performances? There are record of the performances. There's right. record of the performances of the plays. There's record of the performances of that. We have records. It's just very little known. There's records of uh, who's the boss being played. And there's right. records of the early Hamlet and early Romeo and Juliet. So there are records. They just didn't name the author whenever they talked about the play. And if you right. think about it today, if you're talking about a Saturday Night Live skit or you're even talking about a movie you go see, right. you say, I went to see Gone Girl. You don't say, I went to see Gone Girl written by Julian Flynn. So these people, when they were writing it, when they would, in the Revels right. play, they didn't write down the author. So we have this record. We don't know. Who, someone had to write them. So we have this anonymous author. It's the same thing. The records are lost. So you say, well, why didn't they publish it? No one published vaudeville skits. No one published plays at the time that Thomas North was writing. It's the exact same answer. So, well, my aunt gets really infuriated when I say that someone else wrote, uh, wrote the thing. Well, yeah, that some people get emotionally tied to artists. Of course. Of but, course. Okay, so now Shakespeare. So what Shakespeare was doing, exactly like Abbott and Costello, exactly like the Marx Brothers, exactly like Three Stooges, was adapting old plays. There's decades of old plays that had been written uh, that he could then adapt and put on the stage because the public theater was just new. The first one was 1576, and in the 1590s was really when it was starting to become popular. Same thing with these uh, old vaudevillians. They had all this wealth of comedy material, and they're, now they're going to be in movies and on the radio. Wow. So they put it out. So it's a new medium. So they... They and everyone thinks Abbott and Costello originated Who's On First because they were popularized. He became popularized, so they became associated with their adaptations. So they're called the geniuses. Shakespeare, uh, same way, was adapting lots of works, not just Norris, adapting lots of works. Other authors were also adapting uh, playwrights of the time, also adapted lots of works. So it's not really his fault. And he would make it, and he would make it dramatic. He would cut out, right? Cut out a lot of the chit chat. He cut it out, you know. So I don't mind Shakespeare at all. I don't have a, a bad view. I got bad it. view of him. It's not really his fault. He didn't even publish the plays, most of the plays, at all. They they were published after he died. It's and, just like, yeah. So this is like a script turg. What do they call those? There's people in bro on Broadway because my daughter is going in the musical theater, right? And we watched, um, I think it was Smash. Right. And what, what they would do is you would be writing like um, uh, I'm writing a, a musical. Right. And somebody comes along and we're trying to pitch it to, to Broadway. So they're 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 looking at it and they go, well, for me to fill a ton of seats, you need we need to work. And I think they call it dramaturg. Oh, dramaturg. So these dramaturgs jobs were to take the original 
and it may be really great, but rearrange it. Get this, get this conflict better. Get this. Yeah. The, and so it seems like it's what the, is that like that? It's a little like that. It's more like a screenplay author adapting a novel. It's more like it's more like Peter Jackson and Lord of the Rings, which is the right. example we use right. quite often. And Peter Jackson worked on the screenplay and cut right. it down and did all sorts of stuff and then had it performed and right. then directed. And Peter, I, I love Peter Jackson, but he didn't write right. uh, Lord of the Rings. Right. Well, it's like, and, a, and yeah, it's yeah. the same thing with, you know, and Silence of the Lambs. So if, even if you look at the Roman plays, so for example, what scholars had known, if you look at the Roman plays and all the passages that were taken, there's not a single really anything brilliant original in Shakespeare's Roman plays that was not found originally in Thomas Norris, Plutarch's Lives, the chapters on Antony, Cleopatra, and Coriolanus, and Julius Caesar. There, there's no these speeches that are considered great in Antony and Cleopatra that make the play, and it's not just the plot and characters he takes in Thomas North, he takes the best speeches, which are straight, and you can look at them, you go on my site, you can look at them passage by passage. It is absurd to say <laughs> that William Shakespeare, just on that, just right. on that, it is absurd to say William Shakespeare is the original genius of that. This right. is, he is clearly the adapter. Right. But he never published the Roman plays with his name on them. Right. Shakespeare didn't. And uh, he and the first four of the first five plays he did publish with his name on them, all said augmented and corrected by Shakespeare, not written by oh. William Shakespeare. So even then, and then most of the plays were attributed to him after he died. So here he was, was this great play producer, director, adapter, got a lot of credit. He was He became big when public theater became big. He was known, he became very wealthy. Uh, wow. Sir Thomas North was broke and Thomas North got his credit from the Earl of Leicester and other people and needed the money and sold the place. And well, what how about this thing, what I learned in school that this was a, a an actor who wrote these amazing plays. And I, I never heard the story that he became wealthy. It sounds to me like, oh, you know, he's super wealthy. He was the, the entrepreneur of the thing. He was the largest landholder in uh, the entire Stratford area. So he was like uh, 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 Andrew Lloyd Webber kind of yeah. status. Yeah. Yeah. He, he, he was an entrepreneur. He, he, and, he, and let me tell you, he worked. He worked for this. This is, oh, he's believe. working. Th there's, you should know that he couldn't have really originated the plays. Simply on the fact because not only not only he was working daily performing the place he's in the place he's directing the place he's he's producing them he's putting out forty other plays a year they got to memorize all these plays that they're just putting out week after and week after week they talk about his extraordinary workload now he's teaching himself Italian somehow finding books on Italy where he's able to get all this information teaching himself French studying all these ancient, ancient sources mm. that only really Thomas North had access to it. He's getting hold of Thomas North's journal. He's putting it all together and he's writing his place. No, he just adapted North's plays. Wow. Just like other playwrights did, the only difference is Shakespeare got credit for his adaptations with now, the other playwrights. Now, is this something that you have or is this something that, that your vision or is are there Shakespearean scholars yeah. that know all this? By the way, Steve, Yes, Steve Athern asks, by the way, can Dennis uh, ask about what he discovered regarding murder of Gonzago and Hamlet? Yes, that'd be great. But I'm sorry, go ahead. <laughs> no, that's okay. I'm glad some people, because our people are kind of shocked. They're coming here trying to discuss science in the middle, but that this is yeah. great about th critical thinking. Well, the question is, is this, this, I mean, you're blowing my mind because the way I look at this now, I see, you know, I see this guy as a hardworking entrepreneur. I mean, Michael Jackson didn't do the moonwalk. moonwalk. He didn't invent it. He, he got them from kids on the street, you know, yeah. so yeah, he, he marketed it. So what, it, what I'm asking you is this thing that this person persona that you just described, this hardworking, get out there. It seems like he was at a time where the internet first was available, which is public theater. He recognized that he saw these this great work by Thomas was adapting them like crazy, getting stuff, get in the place, yeah. directing them, getting, is this something that you, Dennis, see that the, the people in Shakespearean circles who are the people who worship this guy and, and. Uh, oh, everybody, they... all biographies talk about his inconceivable workload. 
Really? Basements. Wow. They really do. And 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 all of them, them admitted just about how successful he became, how wealthy he became. Uh, really well known. Um, you know, wow. he became a gentleman. Uh, he got a, a coat of arms and uh, ju he just, and he became the most renowned playwright of the so year. He, it, was, it was him versus the guys at the Rose. Uh, and uh, th he was running that, the entire theatrical output of, uh, of the King's Men, the Lord Chamberlain's Men, uh, which was at the theater. And then the. Uh oh, cutting out again here. The Globe. Oh. Whatever okay. he, he was the major theater entrepreneur, and he was doing all the plays. And he didn't just do North's plays; he did, uh, I guess, maybe forty plays a year. That, wow. So he needed as much material just as, you know, the comics that were using Budville works. Uh, they needed as much material as possible because they're doing all this radio shows or movies, or in Shakespeare's case, he needs content. And um, and he was really he was good at it, and you know, moving. Right, uh, right. So I have no resent. So I, I. Oh yeah, don't. sure. I don't either. I mean, but it's really different from what the public sees of Shakespeare. Because when you go to theater class, and my daughter's taking theater, you know, theater, even though she's musical theater, loves dance, singing, acting, the whole thing. You go to theater, and they talk about this. Uh, I have a friend who is English, and I told him I was going to be talking to you about this, and he goes, "Oh, this is," you know, they just totally whitewash because they get this sort of he, he reminds me a lot of you know who thomas edison thomas edison stole the the uh movie movie camera he wasn't the first people to do that yeah. he was he he was good at the marketing he did some things on his own for sure but he would he just then started sucking up everything he could even see and and he became the entrepreneur the inventor it was half of it was the great business sense really so um what, what kind of blew it at the end but i yes exactly uh i would but i wouldn't i but again i wouldn't uh uh suggest that uh, uh shakespeare is doing anything at all sinister oh no or, no or sure sure uh, no thomas i think thomas edison was a little uh, less scrupulous. Than, yeah, no, he was, he was, and, and I, yeah, and I, but I meant in the sense of people look at Thomas Edison and he invented the, you know, the the movie, the, yeah, all, the all the things projector, that... yeah, and he didn't, and yeah, that's for sure. So, um, oh wow, that's that's just quite amazing. Now, what do you think um, the relationship between now that you know that because obviously you see the connections much more. How do you? Do you think that Shakespeare worked alone when he was doing this? Was no, he working? No, he had co-authors, and they're now. And this is over the last probably thirty years, and this is becoming conventional. He often worked with co-authors. He worked. He didn't just work when it said. It says upstart crow beautified with our feathers. He's talking to Christopher. That that famous line, and there's a television show in England called Upstart Crow about Shakespeare. It's a well-known line. There was a biography about him referring to Upstart Crow, to uh, Sweet Swan. That line in a satirist called in a satire called Green's Grotesque of Wit about Shakespeare uh, uh, clearly is showing that he's what he was get he was also getting credit for other other people's works. Well, right. Green, which he got credit for for more than a century, right. Shakespeare did was actually written by Robert Green. It is likely that's where the uh, that's where some people uh, think it is. Yorkshire Tragedy was written by Thomas Middleton. He worked with Fletcher uh, after his life. So he was working with, play he had right. to. This is, right. The, right. it was the playwriting team, and, but he was the the head of right. the production of all these plays. Wow. He was, he was. I'm sure he was in charge of hiring. The way you hear, the way you read about in satires, he was in charge of hiring everyone and hiring and getting and organizing the plays and getting them, uh, uh, you know, Sir Thomas, it's interesting. The one uh, thing that they think that they have Shakespeare's, sing Shakespeare's handwriting on a play of a manuscript, the only supposed manuscript of Shakespeare, I don't think it's his handwriting, but that doesn't matter. There's five different hands in the play. So there's five uh -huh. different authors um, wow. working on each thing, whether they're copying another play or whether they're whatever they're doing, they're adding all their, their material. And there's now they think, you know, Henry VIII was worked on with Fletcher. Um, uh, some people think Nash also was helping, and 
and things like that. So, so now, so, so yet now you've come and now you're introducing this whole idea that the major works that people that Shakespeare was working on were totally influenced or, or taken uh, uh, from, from earlier plays from, written from, by Thomas North. Plays how we it, know how, existed that there's a record of. There's a record of these plays. So, that, so when when you one of the things that was a criticism I saw was that oh you invented these things yeah. how much of te uh, how much of Thomas's work do we that. have that oh, we I mean, obviously you are using real Thomas works when you're looking at the using the plagiarism software yeah, but no, are there are there some other things that you've discovered that you don't haven't yet found but are pretty certain that also involve Thomas uh, North no, the, the the things that uh, the marginal notes, which we're introducing, I'm introducing on my web page as we go along. And actually, I owe Michael Blanding, the author of North by Shakespeare, for that. He's the one that went in and he noticed some connections to Shakespeare plays as well, like the antagonist thing. Oh, uh, he took <laughs> so he put that at the end of his It was too expensive for me. I wasn't going to get the... Uh, uh, I had known about it. I had known that there was marginalia in the uh, in uh, the Dial of uh, Princes that's there. But I had looked. Through, I had looked through some pages, and I wasn't going to spend the hundreds of dollars because nothing jumped out at me as, as I was skimming it. And then there is there's it's incredible. It's a workbook for. What do you call it? But I didn't go to the right, right. pages and I right. didn't look at the right things. And I was looking for, I was actually looking for other things, but it doesn't matter. But Michael Blandon took pictures of every page while he was there. Hunt, over 700 pictures, I think. Each page. Wow. And then he goes, hey, Dennis, look at that. And he sent me all the uh, all the pictures. Wow. So this is June Schluter helped find the journal and uh, Michael Blanding helped uh, uh, with the, uh, and found the, uh, the Norse annotations, um, right. you know, Right, More right, right. I think you're going to come forward by people who just start studying Thomas North. Right, right. Now, look, we have some people in the green room. Um, I know there's Ian Cohen there, James, and my father's in the green room. If anybody wants to come up here and quest, talk, uh, talk, say anything or uh, make any comments, just raise your hand there. But um, and uh, Steve had a great question, by the way. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. We can put that back up. Um, let me find okay. that. Okay, um, Steve, da, 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 there we go. Uh, this one here, uh, no one yeah. denies that Shaq uses sources, uh, or is this a different one? Yeah, I'll take that one too. Okay, yeah, I can take either one, but the other okay. one, the other one's better. So okay, uh, let me get, let me do that one there. Is this it um, about the murder of Gonzo and Hamlet? So to give you an example, of, and this Gonzaga. is why people like Mark Twain and a lot of top writers and scholars, Walt Whitman. Uh, questioned Shakespeare's authorship, and it really came, the, the origin of the Shakespeare's authorship uh, question comes from the fact that he adapted plays, and people just kept finding this and saying right. Shakespeare was using source plays all the time. Then right. this guy named Joseph Hart said, well, who's the genius? Who's the genius that wrote it? And then right after that, all these authorship theories came forward. And um, one of the things that intelligent outsiders uh started to realize that there was so much law in the plays that really intricacies of the law, there's all sorts of trials in, uh, in various Shakespeare's plays. And there's right. all sorts of information about Italy, 10 of the plays or of so course. are course. set in Italy. And it's not just, there. there's all sorts of very uh, uh, minor details about right. each city, whether it's Milan and there's St. Gregory's Well, just outside of Milan. Right. And you don't, and there aren't, there is no internet at the day. There is no libraries. Right. There are no libraries. Right. There are no travel logs. It's like, how does he know all this information? And usually scholars say, oh, well, some Italian traveler must have informed him of it. And yes, that's right. And I know the Italian traveler. <laughs> North, and he didn't whisper. He didn't say, oh, by the way, Shakespeare, listen, uh, there's a well outside of Milan. Oh, and in Venice, you know, this is, you know, there's blah 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 and in uh in pisa they like the uh citizens there's a gr famous graveyard and blah, blah blah he didn't tell this to him he wrote it down in plays in shakespeare death the, right, play. the right, italian yeah. traveler and it's amazing they don't put that together because they often right. know they know for two gentlemen verona that there's a source play for it 
So why they don't think, why did it never dawn on them that, oh, well, this information about Italy was in the source book. But in any case, so authors would, uh, v various writers, genius writers like Mark Twain would say, okay, there's no way he could do write these plays right, of course. Italy, or write these plays on the law and all of this intricate, these legal puns and this uh, right. these legal things, unless he was actually involved in the law, unless he actually had gone to it, unless right. he'd actually been to war, there's all this right. terminology. There's a book on Shakespeare's legal language, an actual dictionary, a dictionary <laughs> of Shakespeare's legal language. There's a dictionary of Shakespeare's military language. Oh my God. And the, and you have, to, so you have to look at it so you can understand it to show you how much wealth right. information and Shakespeare is working the theater, you know, 12 hours a day and putting on other, other plays. He's not getting all this information. These were in the source plays, all this information. This solves for the Orthodox scholars. This solves their problem with how this information got there. But one of the things that Steve asks is about the murder of Gonzago in in Hamlet, which is a true story, which they discovered in the 19th century about the murder of Verbino, who uh, the murder of the Duke of Verbino, who had allegedly poison poured into his ear and by a relative. Right. And the exact same story as the murder of Gonzago and the. And the Name of the family that was involved in it was Gonzago. The others, Della Rivera, but Gonzago. It was actually Gonzaga, but right. in Thomas Norris' journal, it's Gonzago, which is why it's called Gonzago in the play. But in any case, this story was not only never published in English, it was never published in Italian. The, no one discovered this until uh, the 19th century when they found it in letters between wow. the various dukes about this story of this murder. Oh my God. And um, uh, so it, how Shakespeare got a hold of it is, you know, it seems impossible. But Thomas North, just as he's visited Mantua and knew about Giulio Romano, he visited Pissarro with the Duke of Urbino, with the son of the guy who was murdered. Another thing that scholars have found, Jeffrey Bulla, the greatest source scholar, the most renowned source scholar, has written volumes of Shakespeare's sources, said, and also the author seems to have known the painting of this Duke that had been killed because this is how Hamlet's father had been right. killed because right. it's the same description. And it's with, you know, he's got the the, the same, uh, he's got a major sword by his side and the beaver's up and he's buried in his armor. And there's all these, uh, there's all this information about it. That's exactly like the painting at, that would have been held at Pissarro but that was the of the family of the Duke of Urbino. So it's the name Gonzago and the whole story. And they're saying, we don't know how Shakespeare got a hold of it. Well, all I have to do is accept that when the satirists were saying Thomas North wrote the early Hamlet, that Thomas North wrote the early Hamlet, and this information was in that play because he's the right. one that visited Pissarro. It's that right. simple. And we could do this play after play after now, play. Now, now is yeah. it the case that, that um, when, do we have any, real connection any written connection between shakespeare saying that he's using these uh, play no, uh, these things no, nothing. nothing no manuscripts nothing. of shakespeare was uh, that was that do you think that was a conscious decision by shakespeare no i don't i don't think i think when he left i think he when he retired back to stratford he just forgot about the theater completely. He had no books in his will, That's uh, which anti sephardians make much of. They try to claim he's illiterate, and that's obviously not true. Yeah, but sure, uh, yeah, sure. but there are no books, but just to show you, there's no manuscripts or any of the plays or any of the things. They've got a will for him. We don't have will of Thomas North, but I guarantee you there's a lot of books in him. <laughs> right, right. Now, so do you think then, is it was it just part of the process that he was going through at the time of, I am going to, uh, you, there's this new thing called public theater. I'm going to grab all these great works. I know of Norse stuff. Um, he just he, needed he, material. And it's right, he needed it material. Yeah. Right. And so he did that. And so he just got caught up into it. And so he didn't ever go back. I mean, he, yeah, he, I, I, uh, at the time, those things based on North were, were weren't those the best uh, or, or the, or at yeah, the time, they, those they were the best. best and and that's what we now call his canon. The works right, that he borrowed right. from North. The other works that he published that had that were published with his name on them, they say, oh no, 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 people were conspiring to frame Shakespeare for mediocre work, like Yorkshire Tragedy right. and Thomas Lord Cromwell and uh, London Prodigal, 
all with his name on him while he's alive in London, and no one's correcting it. There's a cone of silence. They talk about the no one, no one ever said that Shakespeare didn't write these plays. No one tried to correct the record. Why did he? Get, why was his name on them? Because he adapted those plays. Mm -hmm. Why don't they seem Shakespearean? Because North didn't write those. Middleton wrote Yorkshire Tragedy, which Shakespeare, right. Shakespeare would have worked a little bit on right. it. And it was, and right. Middleton got paid for his duties, and Shakespeare then got credit for it when it was published. Um, it's that right. simple. There's no conspiracies. No conspiracies right. at right. all. Right. And there's all these thousands of lost plays. We know we and we know we have record of them existing that right. Shakespeare right. used. And right. I have the wow. sixth grade of Sunday. I've got his yeah. journals. I've got Thomas so, Sorrell's note works that he used for the plays. So so tell me where you stand today. Obviously, you have an incredible author who has written about this journey that you've been on, writing like about Michael you. Right. Right, Michael Blander, and uh, right, and Blended. he Blander. But you got, thank you. It's, it, unfortunately, you know today it's e-books, right? So, yeah, I like real books. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get the real book. Uh, but for, uh, but you have him writing about it. You have how many people um, are now Shakespeare um, uh, historians that are starting starting come around? Is that slowly happening? Is this just happening? Not, Is it, not yet. There's going to be a major news story. When the first, and this is really true, and this person's going to be a hero forever. Uh, one of one of the major uh, top Shakespeare scholars, other than Jim Schluter, um, is going to have to come forward and say, "Yeah, I think there's something here. There's more evidence." That now I've gotten very kind comments from a lot of type uh, Shakespeare scholars on other works like the George North manuscript right. Right. and uh, and that discovery. But again. That wasn't big, but the first scholar that comes forward and says, yeah, there's something here. Yeah, we have to admit that Thomas North wrote some of these source plays um, is going to be is, is going to be here. He's going to be the, you know, the each revolution needs those people. And the scholars right. that just and those scholars like the CS Monitor uh, review said those scholars who ignore this do so at the risk of their reputation. Uh, and that's the last line of the thing. And uh, not only do I agree with it, the scholars who come out full, you just in these insane attacks, and there right. are a few of those, I mean, just, it's off yeah. the wall. Uh, they're really not going to come. Well, you know what's funny, though, because I one of the, over. yeah, when I first got into dissident work in science, people who were outside and found, I, you know, I found a, a scientist who was, working outside the mainstream, re, re, uh, disputing something, right? First thing I did was go to the library where I lived in Long Beach and check out all the books on scientific revolutions, right? What happens then? When when an idea new comes, a new idea comes along, what happens? Well, I was really shocked to read one of the books, only one, but I found one book about Newton. And it said Newton uh, retired uh, with his job at the Mint, I guess if you are like retired from academia, you go to the Mint because they do physical stuff there. And you, it's like a cushy job, like, you know, a lobbyist gets a job or a, a, po a politician, right? So you got that and spent the rest of his days arguing his theories to his peers. Now, you, we all think that Newton was completely accepted. Everybody worshipped the guy because no, of no, his no. new work. It wasn't that way. He was 100% of the time. There isn't an example of an intellectual revolution that wasn't fought. And I mean, with everything that people had, they would just go after him. I mean, obviously, we know the story of uh, Galileo. We know the story. Right. But everything. Uh, John James Watterson is the kinetic theory of matter in heat and gases who had the right, right. formulas for right. Uh, temperature and pressure and the explanation to it. And he couldn't get published. And, you know, he was a doctor outside the field. Uh, Wagner, uh, which is famous in Continental Drift, which he had in 1912. He published his Continental Drift in 1912. It's not really accepted until the 1960s. He dies right. unknown in the blizzard of Greenland. Right. And um, right. they just and he was ridiculed the entire yeah. time that he died. And these people are now recalled, these professors that yeah. ridiculed. Uh, what, I mean, when you look at the maps that, that Wagner had and you have the fossil evidence connecting where the maps come together, that's over. That's over. And they still, you know, they still refuse to believe it because they're giving up everything they've taught. They're giving up their own books. 
This is how much pressure is on these these, if you wonder why professors are academics, it's everything they've been teaching. Scholars have been writing books. It, it's their entire source of income and source sure. of pride is being sure. completely challenged by some idiot outsider. Right. That's, That's they always, yeah. They fight, so they fight with everything they got. And yeah. it's understandable why they would have an emotional uh, reaction against it, but it's just someone's got to have the courage. Actually, just go to thetimelessnorth.com and look down those, there's no other example yeah, like this. Yeah. They'll say, oh, well, people were influenced. This isn't influence. This is hundreds of passages yeah, in every yeah. work. If you go to sirthomasnorth.com, just screen down and then- I mean, the other thing is too, is your motive. Weapon. Your motive. I mean, what is your motive? I mean, it would be different if you have, I don't know. I, I, I can't even come up with a motive of why you would try to hu- well, be a I, huckster. I didn't, know Thomas North. I didn't know who Thomas North was. Exactly. I mean, you, you'd have to be some kind of but, huckster. I mean. I mean, well, it's, I conned my way in. I conned my way to Jim Schluter. I conned yeah, my way exactly. I conned my way onto the front page of the New York Times. I conned my way onto the onto the cover story of the Boston Globe. That's what they think. That's literally what they think. Yeah, I mean, but I mean, but it's like any any attack. They'll they'll just attack without even answering the question. You try to show them evidence, and they're going to say, "Oh no, uh, they, they don't." There's no evidence. All they have is no you're wrong and let me tell you why you're right i mean a, a good example of that and i know we're not talking about science was like the gravity waves there's a couple of people in denmark that said hey it's only noise and so what did they do instead of getting together and talking about it they went to the to literally flew to the den den to denmark and tried to school them in the way they should think about it, right and and that kind of attitude is so uh, an, a question to you is you dennis mccarthy um obviously you this is coming out now what do you how do you see yourself in all of this um are you already on another project are you no. continuing on this um, uh, I will continue on this for, I got to get the web page out. I got to get all the stuff. I still have so much stuff that's coming out. Right. Uh, and, and I'm going to have a video, by the way, I'm going to have a video, which um, probably within a few weeks, which is going to be me explaining, going through, I'll be a lot calmer than I am right here. No, Let me okay. answer questions no, no. off the cuff. I get a little excited and I want to apologize. Oh, no, no. Could you- but in any case, uh, I'm going to, uh, uh, I have a video just explaining, taking uh, people through the uh, all the evidence for it. That right. first of all, that the place existed, that these lo- that these early plays existed, that Thomas North was a playwright. Then I'm going to show the evidence for it, both in his passages and how there's and there's really smoking guns. There's no other explanation know, there is for how there. Thomas North's passages got into the Shakespeare canon, other than. The simplest one, which is that, oh, he's the author of the source plays. And there's certain examples. Another smoking gun is the fact that other people also adapted Norse works. So you have uh, 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 Green, Robert Green, wrote a novelization of Thomas North's Winter's Tale before Shakespeare did Winter's Tale. Now, all scholars think that Shakespeare borrowed from Robert Green, but it's rather easy to prove that both works as you can with languages descended from a earlier ancestor, and that was North. One of the ways to do it, they're both borrowing from the same pages of Thomas North for at the same time and the same passage. And the only way that can be is that they're both borrowing from an earlier work by Thomas North. So did you did you do any of this plagiarism analysis between Thomas North and other playwrights other than Shakespeare? Yeah. And did you find very similar things going on? No, no. So no, unless you have except in the works that they're there. So Robert Greene, right. um, when he does, when he wrote this novelization of Thomas North's Winter's Tale, then you have passages come up that, right. because he's, he's also borrowing in some of the lines of Thomas North's original seep in and you can trace their origin. Right. So no, they, they're, they're typically writing their own stuff, uh, Green and, uh, and other people, but Ben Johnson went back and, when Nash is spoofing Thomas North, as he spoofs other writers, and all these satirists spoofed a lot of writers, they'll quote him. So then it will come up there. So, right. um, you know, when plagiarism software, if you put in the works of Nash, you'll see, oh, he's quoting him here, he's quoting him here, he's quoting him there. But that's all the time when they're talking about the original author of right. the Shakespeare plays. Right. So, so how is it then um, for, again, people who are very new to this, because this is recorded, people come back and watch. We get, right. Most of our watching comes after 
in fact, right? But um, how is it, how is it, do you see, do we have evidence of Shakespeare, what, licensed these from Thomas North? He what, bought what them. Was... He, yeah, he bought them. It, it, the, the exact phrase by Ben Johnson is he would buy the reversion of old plays, which means reversion is a uh, kind of a legal term. Your right to use them when the other person's done or has died or whatever, your, your right to use these plays afterwards. And um, it's kind of like a copyright. And he would buy the version of old plays. And uh, they say he marks not whose twas first, but he never really published a lot of the plays with them. But I'm sure what happened was when they were, you know, it's Shakespeare. So, did, so, so what's the overlap? And again, I apologize. What's the overlap of the ages of Thomas uh, Thomas North, North? 29 years older than William Shakespeare. So did, did Thomas North watch his plays become he might have he, he might have yes he probably was it when he was working for with and for shakespeare um he would have seen shakespeare's adaptations of his of his plays so do you think there was i mean i guess the the gap was quite big do you think there was a time where north goes wow this guy it's sort of like this guy's making a lot of money off me like the guy the two guys from facebook from i don't know harvard or princeton or whatever who uh contracted uh zuckerberg first to do it and then they come back saying hey zuckerberg you made a lot of well, money on this I it, mean, did, it, yes there's resent there's resent there is constant resentment you will see also what he called an upstart crow upstart means newly made rich right um right there's constant resentment of Shakespeare's success. So I'm sure uh, as a writer who gets paid a certain amount for his, right. his screenplay, and then the producer makes all the money, <laughs> right? or, you know, or a novel, uh, you know, or a novel, and you see the movie makes all the, you know, all these millions, and like, right. I really didn't get paid enough. I'm sure there might have been, uh, you know, a little, uh, okay. but there was, a, there was a standard rate of how much uh, uh, okay. authors got, got paid. Wow, that this is just you know these are the things I didn't know myself even about about Shakespeare. So 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 right now you have just a plethora of information that you have that you're trying you're going to try to now start communicating this out. Yeah, to the world. essentially yes, and a good place to start is North by Shakespeare and my book, but this is an expensive book. That is, academic books when you write academic books. <sighs> uh, uh, but it's a lovely book. And by the way, FDU Press, uh, Farley Dickinson University Press is wonderful. And there's an mm -hmm. editor there who's a, a, a very big fan and tweets all my stuff. So I love him. But uh, if you can get this at the library, it's $100. But uh, okay. you might be able to. Uh, right. Uh, yeah, but I but I do like the, the university press. Academic books tend to be very expensive because the universities right. get them. That's how they make their money. Right, right. Um, exactly. And... Um, Michael Blaine is a good place to start and my webpage to thomasnorth.com and go through it and you can look at there's a fact there there's a blog post in which right. each of the passages I've got 50 passage 50 it's posts great. on the passages and showing uh how they're necessarily related and how the one passage the one source passage of north was derived from Thomas North. So if you're uh, a Shakespearean scholar right now you really basically have to close your eyes plug your ears and just yes, that's bitch and moan. Some if, of these if, things, as with the journal stuff and and the uh, stuff, they can't just say, "Oh, well, Thomas North, William Shakespeare was following Thomas North's prose works. He just got his prose works and was using those." Some of the evidence, like with the journal and the marginalia, right, the marginal right. notes that we find, is so convincing, and other stuff that there's no way that Shakespeare could have hoped. The only way to address it is by ignoring it. The only exactly, way yeah, yeah, you and have to. And honestly, the first scholar, the first scholar, there's going to be one that comes forward and he's going to be immortal. Uh, the first major scholar, whoever that is. But and the people that fight it are going to be considered like all the people. Well, that hopefully fight what, what, I'm I'm hoping that obviously you're still pretty young. You seem to be healthy. Um, yep. Hopefully you'll Very get young. a honorable doctor degree, maybe several of them. Years. And maybe from England, from here in the United States, but your work is absolutely phenomenal. Um, I know that uh, it blows my mind and it's really critical thinking the parallels to this and people are wondering why I had you on the show. It's like 
the parallels to this and what happens in the scientific world are, are identical. There's no difference. The, the difference is yeah. people get, they, they make their money off of it. They get ingrained in it. You hear, you repeat it over and over and over. Anytime you challenge it, they go, oh, you, Dennis, you, you, you didn't go to Harvard, Princeton, Yale, Cambridge, Oxford. So what do you know? Um, you, if you were to come here, you would know the truth. These kinds of things happen across the board. And uh, I just find it fascinating. And uh, so people can go to your website and you're gonna have videos coming out. They can buy the book online on Amazon. There are videos, I have a YouTube channel. There's even videos out. Yes, video I know, right. yes. Right. And of course you have a link to that on your website, right? Yes, I do. Okay. You can okay. go and Good go. boy, good boy. Extra, under extra. <laughs> videos, so, I chose smoking guns, PDFs. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. But uh, I really want to thank you and I want to congratulate you on your work like I have to. I mean, uh, obviously, you know um, uh, about what you've done. Uh, I appreciate uh, your work and, and the work that you've done before, even in science. It's, it's It was just I saw a, a great mind working there. And I really do hope, you know, uh, at least the world will wake up to this. And at least in your lifetime, people are going to go, wow you know, uh, look at the this amazing thing that was found by Dennis and that you know, at least people can can recognize where that came from. But we cer I certainly do. And uh, I'm looking forward. And if you haven't read the book, it starts like a murder novel. It starts out with a murder, right? Uh, yeah. It's, yeah. In the snow. That. It's pretty gruesome. And yeah. so uh, Michael's a great writer. He hooks you in right away. I mean, right. I was I started read. I, I'll read a little bit because I'd have a little bit of time. I, I ended up reading it until about one in the morning. I'm reading and going on. What's going on here? And right. it's just a fascinating story. Congratulations to Michael. Congratulations to you. Um, I don't even know what to say. And, you know, hopefully we'll have you back and hopefully we'll see more of you. I'm just really glad we have a longer version to be able to talk with you because I was so frustrated seeing Seeing that uh, link that you put on Facebook that of the uh, interview, and I thought, which it was I like, thought was a nice interview. They're very, oh, no, 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 no. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not, not first of all, it was great to have they had you on. I think yeah, yeah, super. yeah. It was great they had Mike there. Extraordinary. Yeah. Um, I, I don't poo poo that, but I was wanting a longer version. Is all. Yeah. And so that was you, inspiring. Man, you got it. This is two hours. Yeah. Well, listen, you take care. Take care of yourself. This second COVID shot. Congratulations. Thank you. Bring yeah. it down and get out of here. So take care. Thank you so David, much. Thank you. All right. All right. Bye. Take care. Again, that's uh, Dennis McCarthy, his book, uh, North, uh, I think it's North of, no, North by uh, uh, Shakespeare is the new book. The North of is not available, but um, it's definitely worth it. It's a, it's a, a case study in critical thinking. Um, Dennis is a great mind. He's he he's worked in in the science area as well. So you don't want to want to miss that opportunity to keep your open mind. And uh, congratulations to him. And we're going to get out of here uh, as we normally do. So uh, uh, let's run a few videos and uh, we'll sign off here. I say stay critical, stay thinking. I am David Hilser, your science therapist, trying to get you to the promised land of becoming a critical thinker. Today's critical thinker was abs absolutely off the charts. Happens in all all walks of life, but we we normally focus on science, physics, cosmology, but today we uh, got off a little bit on a different path, but critical thinking is still critical thinking and that's where you should be. Don't believe what I say. Don't believe what Dennis says. Take a look at his website. Uh, again, I'll put that up there. Uh, his website is, uh, it's got his information on it. There it is. Uh, SirThomasNorth.com. Don't believe me. Don't believe him. Take a look at the evidence. That's how you make up your own mind. Ciao for now.